Hey guys! Oh my gosh, I've been filming like a crazy person. It's so nice when I get in the mood and I can knock out some videos and I'm so behind on my like end of February videos because I just had like this crazy ear infection towards the end of February so I got all kinds of excuses so I'm just gonna stop and get into this video. This one's gonna be a tag. Not really sure when it's going up but I've seen a lot of my friends film this tag video and I saw Abby Williamson I think was the first and then I saw Mel and Angie all film this tag so I'll try and remember to link some of those lovely ladies down in my description box and if you guys are curious to hear my answers to this tag, the beauty brand tag, I'm I'm rusty, I don't know what I'm doing. The beauty brand tag was created by Tara Brooke and she seems like she's a smaller channel so I definitely will go ahead and link her as well. Congrats to her for creating such a wonderful tag and I'm excited to answer some of these questions. So without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, the first question. Think back to when you first started your makeup collection. Are there any brands you used then that you still use today? So I think about this a lot because I very vividly remember some of the brands I used when I first started getting into makeup. There was a lot of NYX in my life, a lot of CoverGirl, and then I was also getting into NARS, Urban Decay. Those were the two big high-end like Sephora brands that I used and I still use NARS foundation, the Sheer Glow. That is the foundation I have on today. It's still one of my favorite foundations, such a great shade match for me, but a lot of the other products and brands I was into, I've kind of strayed away from. It's so funny because I used to have NYX blushes and NYX eyeliners, so many butter lipsticks and lip glosses that I don't have anymore because I would go to Ulta with my best friend and we would use that $3 off of 15 dollar purchase and buy like a bunch of different lip glosses and she'd be really into like buying a specific color that was like trending at the time so yeah it's just so funny i did recently pick up a nyx palette though which i had been eyeing for so so long so that was a little surreal and i really really want the urban decay honey palette i think my husband's actually gonna buy that for me um urban decay is currently doing their friends and family sale and i've just been like lusting over that palette because Teresa is dead talks so so much about it so now the nostalgia coupled with all these people raving about this palette has me thinking about it so we'll see but yeah it's kind of funny you know you start off and you love these certain brands and then you just find more brands and different things that you're into and your makeup style changes so it's really really funny how that happens follow up which brands have you moved on from so i feel like i already answered that question i i don't think i've moved on i think i've taken maybe like a pause but I, it's not about the brand it's more about the product how it makes me feel how it wears on me the price point um, like i said i recently picked up a nyx palette and i haven't felt the urge to buy a nyx palette in a long long time i also picked up that yellow blush that they have oh my gosh i saw it on sale it was like five dollars and i've been eyeing the likely makeup clown blush palette and the other blush palette that they have these two beautiful blush palettes they're like 40 ish dollars um if i buy them both at the same time and i really don't want to spend 40 dollars on blush so i thought let me just buy a yellow nyx has a yellow blush let me try it out see what i even think of it um and go from there so very excited to see what I think of that blush. Number three, are there any brands you thought were so expensive that you never buy anything from them, but now consider at least one of their products to be a holy grail? If so, which brand and which product? Okay, so for me, I think the number one answer to that question is Sonia G brushes and Wayne Goss brushes. I never, ever, ever thought I would own Sonia G brushes because they're, they're pricey. I mean, you know, it's it's easy for me in my head to justify like an eyeshadow palette because I love eyeshadow palettes so much. But Sonia G brushes and Wayne Goss brushes have really changed how my eyeshadow applies, I think. Um, I think it's hard for some of us um, to see the value of investing in good brushes. And even me, I still buy affordable brushes as well. I don't just 
only use my Sonia G brushes. I like to try a mix and Honestly, I do feel a difference when I'm using my Sonia G brushes because some of them are such specific shapes and they do certain things so well. And I recently picked up the Sky Brush set from them as well. I really like the high-end eye brushes. I don't really mind slumming it with the face brushes. Like, I have Morphe, I have Real Techniques. Those things work just fine for me. But when it comes to Sonia G eye brushes, that's definitely... Um, something that, you know, I never thought I would have been able to bite the bullet and buy, but I definitely consider those brushes holy grail brushes and would 100% recommend trying them out if you're, you know, curious and you want to see, like, what the next level of eyeshadow application is like, I would recommend checking out those brushes and maybe skipping a few eyeshadow palettes to pay for it. Number four, what is a popular brand that you've never tried and don't think you ever will and why? Okay, so a popular brand that I've never tried and don't think I ever will. I feel like I have to pick something really bougie, like something like Chanel or Tom Ford or by Terry. The thing is, I've tried the Chanel bronzer. I feel like that's like their most popular product and it's too light for my skin tone. I think I could use it as a foundation if I really wanted to, which I don't. And Tom Ford, I did try two or three two of his eyeshadow quads and I thought they were so overpriced for the price point. 80 bucks for those, I don't get it. Like I know a lot of bougie YouTubers have um, Tom Ford palettes in their collection and I honestly don't get it. I really don't. Um, maybe someday I'll, I'll understand why they're so special but I don't get it. Um, I guess another one too, thinking of Teresa's dad, is Chantecai. I've never really been drawn to that aesthetic. I also don't really know if they have a shade range that accommodates people with darker skin tones or tan skin tones. So yeah, yeah just not interested, can't afford it, don't think I want to try it. Next question, what brand perfectly encapsulates your current makeup aesthetic? Explain. That's a tough one. There's so many brands that I'm into for different reasons. I would say, mm, I still love my Amrisi palettes so much. I kind of want to say Anastasia's eyeshadow palettes because they're like glam, but they're neutral, but they're also colorful. And I love that formula. Pat McGrath because I love her shimmers. Sydney Grace because I love the shimmers. Like, there's so many. I'd be such a mix and hodgepodge of brands that it's so hard for me to pick, but... If I like gun to my head, I had to pick, I would pick a little bit of Natasha Denona and a little bit of Anastasia Beverly Hills. Cause I, I'm like, I, I like to play with color, but I'm also like a neutral girl. So I think both of those brands do color and neutral really in a fun way. Um, that can also be day to day. So I really like that about both those brands. Number six, are there any brands you haven't wanted to try purely because you don't like their packaging? Uh, the only one I can really think of off the top of my head is probably that brand. I can't remember the name of the brand, but it's that brand where all the packaging is like K-shaped. It's like some brand started by like, I can't remember if she's like a real housewife or what she's famous for, but she's like semi-famous or she, maybe she's full-blown famous. I just don't know who she is. Um, her brand and then... Yeah, the K packaging just looks so obnoxious. Even though my name starts with a K, I have no desire to try that um, particular brand. And then the other thing, too, I find really kind of repulsive is uh, Florence by uh, Millie Bobby Brown. She's got this, like, palette that splits into, like, three different pieces, which doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know. Her her brand is very like tweeny. I, I don't know why stores like Ulta carry her brand. I think she's more of like a Claire's. Like I think that makeup does not belong in an Ulta store. I saw it there the other day and I was showing my husband because he walked into the Ulta store with me and I was like, honey, this is Eleven's makeup brand. And it was all like purpley and I, mm, I have my thoughts on celebrity makeup brands. Anyway, Number seven, is there a brand you've tried because their packaging lured you in? If so, were you happy with the actual product? Most of the time, I think I am pretty happy. It definitely melts. 
a more eternal collection lured me in. That packaging was very attractive. I was definitely lured in by the packaging for the Manny palettes, the Strawberry Dreams and the, what is the other one called? The, what is that palette called? The one with the, the witchcraft, like <laughs> that one. Those two definitely drew me in. The Avocado palette from I Heart Revolution, even though I haven't tried it yet, um, that packaging really lured me in as well. So yeah, I definitely, definitely am have bought stuff because of packaging and most of the time I am happy with with what's inside as well. Number eight, some would say that drugstore and mid-range prices are starting to overlap. What drugstore beauty brands are guilty of making this happen and what are your thoughts on rising drugstore makeup prices? See the thing is I think that you can still buy affordable drugstore makeup but how do you differentiate then between drugstore and high-end and mid-tier? Because in my opinion, you can buy a $12 eyeshadow palette that's ColourPop, but it's not drugstore. And you can buy, you know, an e.l.f. bite size eyeshadow palette for $3 and love it. Um, but that you know, that doesn't consistently happen across the board with drugstore brands. Like, there's plenty of drugstore brands that have quads at the drugstore, but that doesn't mean they're good. And then e.l.f. has that, like, Earth and Ocean palette, which I just tried, that I'm, like, so shook by. Um, to be honest, that thing, I've only used it once, but I was really impressed with the eye look I came up with. So, I think there's a little bit of magic in that palette. How can you say that that rising cost isn't justified, I guess is what I'm trying to say, because I'm so happy that Milani has stepped up their eyeshadow palette game. And yes, the prices have gone up a little bit, but for the increasing price, you're getting better packaging. You're getting more pigmented eyeshadows, I feel like. I mean, I've been shopping at the drugstore more than I ever have before, whereas before I was getting... Yeah, I was getting something affordable, but I wasn't getting the same quality I was getting from high end. And now I feel like, yeah, I'm paying a little bit more, but I also feel like I'm getting a lot more for the price I'm paying. So I would rather pay a little bit more and get something good than pay four or five dollars and get something that I'm not very happy with. The other thing too is like profusion. Like seriously, you can get like 40 eyeshadows for like 10 bucks and I mean, I haven't tried a lot of things from Profusion, but I feel like they make pretty good stuff. So I think that's really impressive that drugstore brands are really stepping it up and trying to deliver some good quality products at a really good price point. Number nine, with anti-consumerism and an eat the rich mentality starting to take hold in the YouTube beauty space, are there any brands you still feel a loyalty towards if so why um yeah I think so I definitely feel loyalty I mean I wouldn't like stake my whole like YouTube channel on brands but I still enjoy high-end brands I still like Pat McGrath you know Anastasia Melt Natasha Denona Huda Beauty KKW like there's so many exciting brands I just like what they're doing and I like what they've been delivering and I'm excited to see what is to come. I also think that for me there's a huge pull towards indie brands because they're coming out with so many of these fun like multi-chromes and things like that. So I think it's all necessary in this space and everyone's kind of pushing each other to be better and better and better which is what we need. Number 10. Have you ever felt betrayed by a brand? If so, what happened? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's just life, right? Like, brands aren't our friends. Of course, things are gonna happen. And I think for me, like, brands that make it really hard for you to return things alone is like a betrayal. Like, don't make it like my problem that your shit sucks. So that's always annoying. I think I felt pretty butthurt when the Volt collection was a flop because I was so excited and I bought it. And then the the whole thing about the palettes and the numbers and the labeling and la di da di da and so yeah there's there's plenty of disappointment but that's just life right number 11 are there any brands that you feel give off exclusivity vibes making you feel like you aren't cool rich or pretty enough to buy from 
If so, which brands and why? I think definitely some of the brands that are more and more high-end and I mean that that's just a me problem. It's not the brand's problem. Maybe that's I don't know. I don't I don't I don't really want to play like the victim card like poor me. I think the other thing too is like I don't feel like I'm not cool enough. I just feel like they're not cool enough because as far as like shade ranges and stuff goes. The La Mer foundation, the $200 foundation. I don't feel like being able to buy a $200 foundation makes you cool. Being a cool person is what makes you cool. If you can afford a $200 foundation, like good for you, but that's not gonna make or break your life if you can't buy a $200 foundation. So I don't know, maybe I'm misinterpreting that question, but I don't think anything should make you feel like you aren't cool or rich or pretty. Like you buy what you wanna buy and if you can't afford to buy something, it's just stuff. Like it's gonna be okay. As long as you can eat and take care of yourself, like your life is not gonna end because you can't have something that somebody else has. Number 12, what's worse? Choice fatigue, exhaustion from too many makeup releases or a lackluster quarterly launch from a brand you're typically excited about? I think for me is lackluster quarterly launches from a brand. I think the more choices, the better. I think that if brands have cool ideas, they should produce those ideas. It's like artists, like if you have a good idea, why would you suppress that? And why is it your problem if people feel like there's too much makeup? Like that's something I don't understand when, and I'm sure I'm guilty of this too, is like when we as a community complain about this amount of stuff coming out, it's like there's no gun pointed at anyone's head saying, you must buy all the makeup, you know? That's where I feel like we kind of like throw the responsibility back at the brand when it's essentially like, who's in control of my wallet? Not the brand, I am. So if there's too many things coming out, then it's my obligation to make sure that I'm keeping myself in check. It's not the brand's problem to like dim their ideas so that we don't feel guilty into buying all of that stuff if that makes any sense. So number 13, have brand trips or sponsored videos ever made you actually interested in a product beauty launch the brand was promoting? Oh, I think so. I don't know so much about brand trips. I feel like they happen less and less. And honestly, I don't have the time to follow like influencers as much as I used to. Like I was addicted to Snapchat and then I just got so sucked in and I was, I'd be at work like watching people's like Snapchat stories and I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Like I'm wasting so much of my time following these people's Snapchats and I think Snapchat was also the time when like those tripping with Tarte things were huge and brand trips were huge and so brand trips never really drew me in because I was never really interested in the brands that were taking people on trips uh, but I think sponsored videos are really an efficient tool to get people interested in products. If some of my favorite people do sponsored content and they're interested in something or they make it sound interesting, of course it makes me want to try it. And I don't think that's a bad thing. It's a good thing because if I trust that person and they're putting their name behind something, I feel like that's a good enough, you know, seal of approval for me to go ahead and then try the product. So those are my thoughts on that. Number 14, are there any indie brands you hope to see sold at Ulta or Sephora in the future. I think I want to see what is best for indie brands. I think a lot of indie brands have so much control of their creativity because they are indie brands. I don't know if they would be able to exercise that same level of control if they were to go into a store like Ulta or Sephora. I think from the past, even seeing brands like Melt and Sugar Pill that used to be um, indie and kind of do their own thing go into stores like Sephora of course I'm sure you guys have noticed and heard of like the standards that Sephora has like sometimes you have to do like exclusively available at Sephora launches and um, you know they expect brands to do so many launches in a year and I don't remember exactly what I heard or where I heard it from, but I think there's like different quotas they have to meet um, at Sephora. So I think, I don't know that I would necessarily wanna put stress on indie brand owners that would 
be what would happen if they went into a store like that. I've also seen indie brands that went into stores like Ulta and Sephora and it didn't work out. So, you know, for that particular reason, there's nothing really off the top of my head. It would be nice to see brands from overseas like I know Angelica mentioned Linda Hallberry I really do think Linda Hallberry would be an amazing fit for Beautylish um, because she's like a little bit more high-end the price point I think it just works I can see that working out really well um, especially because she doesn't have a distributor here in the US so you have to order from a Sweden I think is where it comes out of I'm not sure you guys can correct me of course um, but as far as like the US based indie brands, I, I'm so happy with what they're doing right now and I feel like that creative control that they have that is a good thing and it would be really scary to see um, some of the brands I love really like take a turn if they went into stores like Ulta and Sephora. So I think everyone's good where they're at to be honest. <laughs> Number 15, if you could give any beauty brand a rebranding, which brand? Would it be and what elements of the brand would you modify? Say like this was Shark Tank and I had like a bajillion dollars. I would, I wouldn't rebrand Sydney Grace, but I would just give them a new website because that's something I've just seen so many of their consumers say is like, I want to buy from Sydney Grace, but I wish their website was easier to navigate and X, Y, Z thing and working in the industry that I'm working in, I know that taking on a website is a lot of work and especially if you have a bunch of products and things like that, it can get very complicated and very expensive. And that's the thing I think of a lot um, as an indie brand owner and just like a beauty brand owner, I feel like consumers are so harsh on brands like indie brands um, because they maybe don't realize what is going on behind the scenes and I think that would be something that would be really cool for brand owners to talk about more on their platforms is the hardships of being a small business owner. I think that if there was more transparency and more communication there, customers would be more understanding of things that are happening. Um, so yeah, I think, I don't think there's anything wrong. Um, with Sydney Grace, um, as far as their product, their customer service, um, the women behind the brand seem amazing. Um, but I think that if they were to get a new website, it would be like a gift for them because I could see their sales just, you know, going up even more and more than they are already because it would just make it so much easier to shop their site. So. Um, yeah, hopefully that wasn't like me trying to be shady at all. You guys know I love the brand. Um, I've gotten some PR from them and gotten to interact with them. And Heather, the sister that runs their Instagram, is very, very supportive. She's been, I don't know, following me for quite some time. And yeah, she's just always really, really great and really sweet. So I'm very appreciative of them and I, I want them to succeed. So yeah. That would be the one brand and the rest of the brands, they can afford it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not giving anything away if I had Shark Tank money. Yeah, hopefully that answers that question. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this tag video. I had so much fun filming this. These questions are kind of tricky, like they really make you think. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Have a wonderful day and I will see you guys in my next one soon.